I also leave my toys behind at church. Oh, leave your toys behind at church, and hopefully they're still there when you get back, right? Okay, so Lenny's mom says, where is your jacket? Lenny says, I forgot it. It's at school. His cat is like, oh. Forgetting something can frustrate you. And it can not only frustrate you, it can frustrate others. But it's too cold to play outside without your jacket, says Lenny's mom. Lenny says, I wish I hadn't left it at school. Right? He left it, so it's frustrating. He can't go outside and play without his jacket. Right? And his mom would like him to go outside and play, but he doesn't have his jacket because he forgot it. Try not to be forgetful. There are things you can do to help yourself remember. Lenny said, I need to stop forgetting things. The cat says, yeah, <laughs> Do this to help you remember. Okay, here's, here's the tip. Listen up. Ask yourself this question before you leave someplace. Am I forgetting something? So, when you're leaving this place, church today, ask yourself the question. Am I forgetting anything? See, Lenny? Lenny is asking himself the question. He's leaving his house. He says, am I forgetting anything? And the cat says, let's see. You fed me. You have your backpack. Your shoes on. Do this to help you remember. Ask someone to remind you about something you do not want to forget. His dad says, remember to take your rock collection to school today. Lenny says, oh yeah, thanks for reminding me, Dad. Have you guys ever tried that? Asking someone to help you remember something? Good. Do this to help you remember. Write yourself a reminder. Pin the reminder to yourself. Or put it in a place where you're sure to see it. Or maybe instead of using a pen, pen, you use a sticky note, okay? All right. See, he wrote, wrote reminders and he hung it up in his room. Um, I am being a reminder that when it's bubbles, um, that means it's thinking, not saying. Oh, thank you. Okay. Do this to help you remember. Write a reminder on the back of your hand with washable ink. See, Lenny? This should help me remember to bring back the toys I borrowed. His friend says, all right. The cat says, just be careful when you use this method because Lenny put ink all over the cat. Do this to help you remember. Put a string or adhesive tape around your finger. Be sure it's not too tight. Do you have something you want to remember? See, Lenny? This should help me remember to bring home the toys I left at Mike's house. The cat says, and this should help me remember to catch that mouse. Do this to help you remember. Put things you want to take with you in a special place so you will not forget them. A good place is next to the door so you will find them before you leave. Like Lenny, I'll put this here next to the door so I won't forget it tomorrow morning. And the cat says, maybe I should leave my food dish there too. Being forgetful can be frustrating. You and the people around you will be happier if you do not forget things. See, Lenny's mom said, did you forget anything? He said, not today. And the cat said, hooray. The end. So boys and girls, you have lots of tips and ideas to not be forgetful so that you don't frustrate yourselves and you don't frustrate your parents. And we develop really great habits and build character, okay? So who would like to pray? Anybody else? Okay. Come on. Okay. Bye. Bye heads and close your eyes.
dear Lord so much for allowing us to have so many different capabilities and being able to learn things that can help us help each other. And dear Lord, please help our children to not be forgetful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will they return to your seats? He goes to 
is my victory <coughs> and my comfort. I will not walk alone. Amen.
it's a long story, but it's popular to everyone, probably. I will not make any assumption, but we're going to be. This is a story about David. And um, David, as God said, is a man after God's own heart. Why, why did God say that about David? There is something unique about his character from the time that he was, before, even before he was anointed, he used to tend his, uh, his father's sheep. And if you recall from the story, uh, when, when Samuel was told to, uh, well, okay, when, when David was meant to be anointed, his brothers were given preference by the prophet. Okay, the prophet said, okay, um, out of all these brothers of yours, or rather when he told his father, where is your uh, youngest son? In other words, God said, of all the, of the brothers of David who uh, uh, came to his presence, God said, no, I have not appointed any of these. But I, I want the one whom I have chosen. And it happened to be David, who was in the field tending his father's sheep. But there was something unique about him. He had a zeal. And he had a heart for God. Let's listen to this story. Okay, this time, the setup of this story is after he had already uh, started to rule as a king. And I'm reading from verse 11, from verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go to, out to battle, that David went and uh, sent Joab and his servants with him. And all Israel and his servants with him. And all, I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. It happened in the spring of the year of that year, at the time when kings go out to battle, and David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Raga. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from the, his bed and walked onto the roof of the king's house. And from the house he saw a woman's a woman bathing, and the woman was so beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Gideon, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And now, as the story continues, he brought, he brought the woman, and after that, um, she conceived. And now, a message was sent to David, and uh, he was told that she was in the child. So now, he wanted to find out from verse 6, from verse 7, uh, from verse 6. Then David sent Joab, saying, Send Uriah the Hittite to me, uh, uh, Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So he calls for his husband because now there is something that he's plotting. Let's see. And David sent Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and the gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the, at, the, uh, at the king's house with all the servants of the Lord, and did not go down to his house. Okay. Did he figure out there's something? No, he didn't. But this is what he said. Uh, when you take, take your time, when you go home and read the rest, and you'll see how this story uh, comes along. So, Uriah says, how can I go to, the house, to my house to sleep there? And yet, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, is at the battle place, at the back of the battlefront, and all the men are there. How can I do such a thing? <coughs> so, David says, okay, all right, you stay over, and tomorrow uh, you can go to your house. Eventually, this man did not go to his house. He slept at the king's gate. And now David says, now I'm going to plot something else. Okay? He brings him over to his house and makes him drunk. With the thought that when he gets drunk, 
who will go to his house? He does not. He still sleeps at the king's or whatever door. Or rather, he sleeps uh, in, in the servants of the Lord, meaning it's the servants of the king. Now, David sees that this man is not falling for my plan. So, what does he do next? Now, Writes a letter the following day, and he sends he sends Uriah to Joab with this letter. And this is death sentence. That's death sentence. So he goes over to, to battle, and Joab executes what the king's the king's desire is to have this man killed. So he sends him to the front line of the battle. This man dies. Now what happens at his house? Let's go to verse 25. Then David says to the messenger, or rather, the messenger was being sent over to David to, uh, you know, to report that you rise there. Thus you shall say to Joel, do not let this thing displease you. For the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. When Uriah, right? I mean, when, David, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent for her to come to his house. And she became his wife. Enter Nathan now, the prophet. Then the Lord said, this is chapter 12 now. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There are two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little eel lamb, which he had, brought, he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And his it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came from the rich. Uh, came from the rich, uh, uh, and a traveler, to the rich man who refused to take from uh, his own flock, or rather, let me just say, uh, this rich man did not want, uh, or rather, the rich man came, um, did not want to take one of his flocks and, uh, you know, provide it for food. So what does he do? He sends for the, uh, the other man's, uh, the other uh, poor man's uh, ear lamp. And what does he do? He spotters it. Is it for food? So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if, that's, and if that had not been too little, I also would have given you much more. So, Nathan makes him aware. You know what he did? It's indeed very wrong. So, as you continue, verse 13 says, So David said to Nathan, I have seen that it's the wrong. Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. Now, there is one distinct thing that you see about David. And 
Why? Let's go back to verse 9 and see why they would say this. Why have you, this is not the why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised him. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your name. Already judgment has been pronounced to him. But what does David do? Remember, as we started, we started with saying, we saw that David is a man after God's own heart. He says, he confesses that he has sinned. Now, let's contrast the story of David to the previous king, King Saul. Did that come right there? Let's go back to Saul now. Now, so if you go back to chapter um, we go back to chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. It's something about Saul. Now, Saul, he was the first king of Israel. And uh, he did a lot and a lot in his team. But there is this one assignment that was given to him. He was supposed to go out and kill all the people of this, um, the Amalekites. Let's read from verse 1 all the way to uh, shall we read from verse 1 to I think verse 4. Okay. Samuel also said to Saul. The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over uh, you know, his people Israel. Now therefore, hear the voice of the Lord your God. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. Now he ambushed, now he ambushed him in the way. Um, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. Now he ambushed him in the way when he came from Egypt. Now go back, go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. But kill both man, woman, infant, and nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Everything. Everything. You should not have left anything. So, so all gathered these people. They went back home. And he executed, yes. But did he execute everything that the Lord had asked him to do? No. So, he brings back home the fattened calf, the oxen, and to make it even more worse, he did not even kill the king. He brings them over to Israel. And now, it's something interesting that we see. Uh, when he comes back home, uh, Samuel now came to him. And he asked him, uh, did you kill everything? No, I'm paraphrasing. Did you kill everything? No. And what is it that I'm hearing at the background? I'm hearing uh, animals, the bleating of, of animals. And he says, no, I brought these animals so that I can sacrifice them to the Lord. Hmm. So, Saul's response to Samuel, prophet, uh, uh, Samuel's prophetic review, or rather, now so this is what happens. Uh, so Samuel gets angry. But before that, what had, what had Samuel gone through the previous night? What had happened? So that Samuel can rebuke um, Saul. 
read from verse 14. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears, and the lowing of oxen, which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God the breasts we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord told me last night. So Samuel was agonizing the previous night. Because now this is somebody that he has watched over time and he anointed. How is it that now he does not want to follow God's command? So he, he, he agonized the previous night. He's, he wept the whole night. So this is why he's rebuking Saul. Why did you follow God's command? Now, what is Saul's response? He says, uh, the people made me do it. Okay, no. They didn't do that. They didn't do it. He made a choice. And this is what Saul said to Samuel. I have seen, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and your words because huh? and your words because I fear the people and obey their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may go and worship the Lord. Okay. His intention was to go and worship the Lord, but he's forgotten what he's done. The reason why I brought this up is because there is something very distinct and important that the Lord will bring to our attention. Saul's response to, sub response to Samuel's prophetic rebuke is met with resistance. And then, with a reluctant confession, Saul partially obeys, keeping back from some of the best cattle and sparing the life of a guy, the Amalekite king. When Samuel arrives, Saul approaches him boldly, pronouncing God's blessing to him, onto him, and claiming that he had carried out God's command. Hear the bleating of the sheep that have been spared. Samuel is not impressed by Saul's greeting. Sensing Samuel's displeasure, this this Saul quickly begins to make excuses, laying the blame for his sin of all the people and insisting that the couple were only kept alive as sacrificial animals. Even after Samuel's rebuke, Saul still denies, Saul still denies his guilt maintaining that he really did obey the voice of the Lord. Only after Samuel persistently refused to accept his excuses, did Saul finally confess that he had seen and that we seen was from four and then that. This is what he call a reluctant repentance. He tries to convince Samuel that even though he had seen, he did not so he did so under pressure of the people. Well, Saul repents, and in an effort to minimize the consequences of his sin. Go back and recall what they did. You see the contrast? Saul seems to have no interest in the cause of his sin or his cure. He on, he's only concerned that his suffering will be minimized. So he asked Samuel to quickly forgive him and then to go on and wash him as though nothing happened. He wants Samuel to accompany him and thereby to honor him so that he does not lose face with him. So, so what's the experience of the repentance, of the true repentance? Let's go back to what David said. Chapter 32 of Psalms, from verse 1 to 7.
Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. Through my groanings, all groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into drop of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I have not hidden. I say, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgive my iniquity. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. In a time when you may be found, surely, in a flood so great of great waters, they shall not overcome near me. Near me. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. So, in this psalm, David informs us that he was silent about his sin. So he must have taken a lot of time to think about what he did. David knew what he did was wrong, but he chose to persist for a time. He did not confess his sin. And the result was agony. It's an amazing thing, but while sin has its momentary pleasures, they are not as pleasurable for the Christian as they are for the heathen or an unchristian. The reason is that God's Spirit indwells in the Christian. This is where this, where this is distinction is. And the Spirit of the Lord dwells in you. There is a difference. As sin grieves the Spirit who indwells in us, our spirit cannot take great pleasure in the sin in the world. I will read that again. The reason is that God's spirit dwells in us. And as the sin grieves the spirit who indwells in us, our spirit cannot take pleasure in the sin in What I'm saying is that you know, the pleasure is minimized, but which you know, gives us joy in obeying God and enjoying the fellowship with Him. The agony David describes finally brought him to seize his silence and confess his sins. His repentance was a result of a painful process, most of which took place privately. Well, you would say his sin eventually was made public, but in his private quarters, he thought about this. For a long time. So what, what does God want us to do? What is he telling us here? You know, we can learn from David. We can learn from David. Could there be anything in anybody's life who is here? Could there be things in our hearts that are drawing and making the spirit of the Lord grieve? You know, before before this word came to me, you know, it touched me, you know, if I spent some time with that guy, I've been thinking about it for a long time. You know, and I say, Lord, if this is what you want me to share, I will. God is speaking to each and every person's heart at this moment. And we all know that God wants to dwell in us each and every day, every moment of our lives. And He's speaking to us. If there is anything in anybody's life, in your life, that you think is drawing the Spirit of the Lord away, grieving you, just take time and think about it just as David did. 
confess to the Lord and repent of it, that may be cleansed. So this is God's response to David. From verse 8 onwards. I will instruct you, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse, the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit of real. Else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, once he shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you have right in heart. So, let us do a recap of this message. Repentance is a divinely wrought action which employs God's spirit, God's word, and God's people as they are implemented in response to known sin. We cannot change hearts. Only God can. In this sense, repentance is the work of God that God has chosen to employ certain means to bring about his, his, his ends. And so, it is with repentance. God uses his people like Nathan to comfort people with their sin. He uses his word and his spirit to convict sinners of their sin. Today, as in times of past, it is easier to, to talk to others about sin in, someone, in someone's life rather than to talk to that person. The Bible says, the Bible gives us a clear instruction about our obligation towards our brother, our brother or our sister who appears to have fallen into sin. And we see in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 1 to 5, we shall not read all that. Or chapter 18 from verse 15 to 20, 1 Corinthians 5 from verse 1 to 13, Galatians 6, 1 to 5. So, all these verses, they tell us what you need to do. So, if you notice as a brother or a sister has something that needs to be rectified, go to him or her. You could be the neighbor in this person's life. No one really wants to be a Nathan. No one really wants to be a Nathan to a baby. But if but this is the normal means God has appointed for dealing with sin or for encouraging the sinner to repent. Nathan was never a better friend to David than when he pointed out his sin, preparing the way for his repentance. Amen. So, repentance is divinely appointed, appointed means of obtaining the forgiveness of sins and enjoying fellowship with God. It is clear from David's Psalms that when he sinned and sought to conceal his sin, there was a breach in his fellowship with God. And David lost the joy of his salvation and the assurance of God's presence in his life. This returned when David repented. Repentance is the expression of faith, and thus the means God has appointed for lost sinner to receive the forgiveness of sins and assurance of eternal life in fellowship with God. Repentance is also required for sinners to forsake their sin and to return to fellowship with God, which has been broken by sin. As Paul says, Paul sought to bring the Corinthian saints to repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, from verse 9 to 10, it says, Yet, now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow uh, your sorrow led you to repentance. 
<coughs> so, there's a key word here. There's two key words here. Being sorry and to be sorrowful. That's the distinction. Well, you could say, I'm sorry. Okay, let's move on. Is that what God wants? No. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and you and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly, but, but worldly sorrow brings death. Repentance is not a very in one and certainly not a very popular uh, practice. It brings with a renewed grasp the holiness of God and thus a realization in the immensity of our sin. It leads to a whole new way of looking at life, this time through God's eyes, as conveyed through the Holy Scriptures. It is a revulsion to, a revulsion to sin, so that, we, so that we determine not to repeat not to repeat it. It results in a renewed sense of God's presence, a new joy in our salvation, and a desire to turn others from sin. Amen? Amen. Dead and dying marriages are revitalized. Love lost is found once again. Amen? Amen. But the bondage of sin, which leads to compulsive behavior and an endless cycle of sin, is broken. It is sad that in our therapeutic age, we use psychological terms to describe spiritual problems. Does that happen? For which the Bible has a description, description and prescription. We come to accept the belief that many spiritual problems cannot be dramatically reversed or improved, but that it will take years of therapy and a very gradual change, if any. Witnesses? Does it happen? How long does it take? But it's not that way in the Bible. It speaks to our response to sin through repentance. So real repentance can and does bring radical change. Radical change. A complete change of character. A complete change. We must first turn back, turn back to the word of God. We must begin calling sin by its biblical name. And, must, and we must call for people to respond in a biblical way. Repentance and faith. Amen? Amen. When real repentance takes place, I believe, it will be obvious. Very obvious. So, those texts that we just read, they only describe the real repentance as it, as it relates to our sin. It describes the real repentance so that we will be able to recognize it in others. <coughs> you will see it. And when there is repentance, we have an obligation to forgive and receive that individual back into fellowship. You know, sometimes you watch and you realize, does that happen in many churches? Do they practice, do people practice uh, discipline? And do they call for repentance? How often does that happen? Do we do that within our congregation? Those churches which also need 
to be ready and willing to recognize real repentance and to receive the repentant sinner back into fellowship. Amen. So, so when somebody, it happens that you know, all of us are sinners. It can happen to anyone. So somebody falls back. What do we do with these people? What do we do with such a person? Do we just send them away? Or can we be a maker and allow this person to come back? This is our call. Let us not be like one of Job's friends calling repentance, calling for repentance where it's not a problem. We take a time to read the book of Job and we see one of his friends say, okay, well, maybe it's your sin that is causing you to get all these problems, you know, all these calamities that came to you. Maybe it's your sin that, it, that does, it did so. But when you read to the towards the end of the story, it's not so. Let's call for repentance where it's appropriate. Not every instance of trial and tribulation is proof of sin on our part. But there are times when our trials are graciously given to us by God to call attention to our sin and to call us to repentance. In such times, let us be quick to take responsibility for our sin and let us confess that sin and then let us let us forsake it. Let us seek to see things clearly Amen. again and to once again enjoy the blessings of salvation of fellowship with God. Amen. This is what God wants us to know today. So Christ is coming soon. May our repentance not be quickened because of the looming judgment, but because we want to have a restored relationship with Him. And may the Holy Spirit continue to dwell in our lives each and every day as we seek Him. And may we spend time in our closets, in our private moments, and if there is anything in our hearts, we confess it. God and repent of those things. Amen. So our closing here will be our song number 287.
honestly come to you. And Lord, may you continue to dwell in our hearts, Lord. And may these words that you have heard today continue to dwell in our hearts and change us into your likeness. Lord, we are looking forward to your second coming, which is much more nearer than we ever expected. Each and every day of our lives, may you use us as your lessons. Give us instances where we could be neighbors and bring our friends back to you. And Lord, if we happen to be in a situation like David, Lord, may you help us, Lord, Lord that we may repent of our sins. But Lord, we may be found worthy in your presence, that you may continue to be with us. May you give us the joy of your, of your salvation. Bring us back to your fold, Lord, that we may continue enjoying with you. We look forward to staying with you, living with you forever and ever. But before that, we ask you, Lord, to continue to prepare our hearts. You've told us that the only thing that you need to take us to you and to your presence, Lord, is our character. May you continue to change us, Lord, that you may be like you. That you may continue to forgive each other, each one, each, each, each other. That, Lord, we may not be judge, judges of others, but that, Lord, you may continue, Lord, to use us and remind us of your word that you believe by it each and every day. In your name we praise you, even as we depart from your power, this place of worship, may you not depart from our presence. Bind us together with your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.